Jeremiah 18. And our main focus will be on verses 3 through 6. Very familiar scripture about uh, the potter. And we want to consider tonight a life made over. Then I went down in the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again, uh, made it again another vessel as seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand, O house of Israel. Uh, tonight, and this reminds me of something I saw uh, several weeks ago on Day of Discovery. They had a potter there, and it was about two or three installments there of uh, how the potter uh, shapes a beautiful vessel there out of the lump of clay. And uh, one of the uh, beautiful lessons of the Christian life is that we as Christians are in the lump of clay in the potter's hand. Uh, he's baking out of uh, that lump of clay in each of our lives that which he uh, would want to make. But we see, first of all, tonight, in a life made over, the potential of a life that response. Now notice, if you will, there, verse 6. O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord. Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. First of all, God is the potter. God is the divine potter sitting there at the potter's wheel. And I believe that they have a foot pedal to make that wheel go around. And he's there forming and, and baking out of that lump of clay uh, that which he would want. A beautiful vessel fit for his service. Ephesians 2, 10 says, we are, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus, under good works which God hath made before ordained that we should walk uh, in them. So we are the workmanship. We are what Christ, we are what the Lord is forming tonight. We are a work in progress. I don't know about you, but I've got a long way to go till I am what the Lord wants me to be. There's a lot of lumps in this old clay as far as my life is concerned. And uh, I'm not always the easiest to work with. But in each of our lives, he desires to make a beautiful vessel. So we see, first of all, God is the pot. Secondly, we are the clay. The clay is the child of God who needs to be formed and molded. Now God loves us just the way we are. Um, it's not a conditional love. He loves us warts and all. But he does want to form and to make us into something better. I know all that I can be, neither are you, all that you could be uh, tonight. Uh, he wants to make something better. He wants to make something more lovely. And that's why we are still there uh, being made in the image. Uh, we're being made in the image of the potter. We're being made uh, more so in the image of God. We're created. In his image, in his work, we are his workmanship. But we are the clay, and the clay is the child of God who needs to be formed and molded. 
And we who have been redeemed by God all began as lumps of clay, every one of us. When we were saved, we all began as that lump of clay. And he put us there on the wheel, and he started working. And uh, you know how the uh, potter will put his hands there and shape the clay there as the vessel of the wheel is moving. And that's the way that it is with our lives today. He's shaking us, he's molded us, he's making us after his own will. Now we who have been redeemed by God all began with bad lumps of clay. How do the hands of God mold us? Well, it is by life itself. You know, God often uses the hard knocks of life to shape his chosen vessel. The will is the circumstances of life. We often do not have control over the circumstances of life. We often do not have control over that which comes our way. God will use it. God will use tragedy. God will use trials and tribulations and temptations all uh, to form us into uh, his image. Romans 8, 28, And we know that all things work together for the good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Now, we say that, and that's scripture, that's an errant scripture, and I think we say we believe. But at the time that we are facing the difficult time of the tragedy, it's not, uh, it's not easy for us to say, well, this is all to the good to God's glory. How can a tragic death of a loved one be for the glory of God? We don't think about it in those times. And I don't think we should try to make sense of it. Uh, that should come later after we've healed and after uh, all of it is over. Uh, Isaiah 55, 89. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. We have to keep this in mind about the divine potter. He didn't think the way we do. He doesn't do the way that we do. God's ways, uh, even among <coughs> Christians, even to Christians, sometimes just don't make sense. A lot of times... God will not make any sense at all. What do we do in those times when God doesn't make sense? What do we do uh, in those times when, when the, the things that happening uh, in our lives just don't make any sense and they just don't jive with our notion, our understanding of a loving God? God doesn't make sense a lot of times. There's been things that's happened in my life that, you know, I thought it would go one way and, and it went the other. It reminds me of a book I have back in there in study. In fact, it's called When God Doesn't Make Sense by James Dobson. And he told about a, a young uh, graduate student who had the, the potential to go into the medical profession. Uh, he graduated the top of his class, and he graduated there from uh, from college and was going into med school, and uh, very promising. And he had a fiance, a beautiful young lady, and everything was was seemingly looking up uh, for this young man until he got a diagnosis of terminal leukemia, terminal cancer. And he died shortly later. And we naturally question. We say, well, why, God, would you allow this young man to go so far in his preparation? Why would you allow him to find a young lady to potentially marry? 
and then take him off. We just don't know. We don't know the mind of God in those circumstances. It doesn't make sense. I believe we'll know the answer one of these days. We might know the answer before we leave this earth. I don't know. There's a lot of things I'd like to ask God on the other side. And then on the other side, you know, it may be so good and, and, and everything that I, I wouldn't even think what I was going to ask him. I don't know. I don't know how it's going to work out. I just trust God to work it out. Uh, and if, when you're in the middle of these perplexing circumstances, just leave it in God's hands. Uh, and we know that in the experience there of Israel, how he brought them out there, and through the many trials and tribulations uh, there, uh, God uh, had a will in doing that. Romans 6, 13, Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness and the sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto uh, God. Um, don't try to understand God. That's, now that's my, that's my job as a, as a pastor, preacher, to try to understand God. And I'll tell you right now, I, I can't. I can only understand what He reveals to me in His Word and through His Spirit. If I were to try to figure out the awesome uh, uh, God, the creator, the judge and redeemer of the universe tonight, I could not. I couldn't. A lot of things don't make sense. A lot of people that get tripped up on certain theological things like the virgin birth, why he, you know, this they would say and it, 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 it trips up a lot of, of men and women a lot smarter than me. Why would God do it that way? How would God do it that way? I don't know. Uh, a lot of things. How does God keep the universe in, in, in orbit, or the earth in orbit, from flying off of his axis? I don't know how he does that. I just accept it. He has set forth the laws of nature and the laws of gravity. I just trust him. I don't know. Maybe I'm, uh, maybe I'm stupid, but I just trust God for all these things. Secondly, we see the problem of a life that resists. 18.4, the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again. Another vessel has seemed good to the potter to make it. Now there might be a hidden impurity in the clay. He might have got a lump of clay there and he started to make it and somehow or another he just couldn't form it in the way that he wanted and he got another lump and he started over. There might be a hidden impurity in the clay. There might be something in our lives that uh, would hinder uh, God's working in our lives. Now, God's going, to, God's going to work in our lives. God's going to make us what He wants. And He may, uh, he may not get it all done now. Like I say, we are a work in progress. He may not get it all done now, but He will eventually, uh, He will get it done. The clay might not be broken enough. You know, God may have to break us just a little bit more. God will break us. God will break His children. God will break His stubborn will. There's many a man, a man who has been called to preach, and even me myself somewhat, running from the cult. And there's a lot of men uh, older and more wiser than me that run further from the cult than what I did. But as the old saying is, the hound of heaven got after them. And they finally, and he finally, uh, uh, folks, if God has, and it is your will, to call a man to be a preacher, well, if he has any peace in his life, he's going to have to, to accept, he's going to have to surrender 
to the call, or it may be something uh, in, in the rest of your lives. I don't know. The clay may not be broken enough. We need to yield everything in our lives to Christ. And only when we're fully yielded, only when we allow the potter to fully make of us what he wants, how he wants, is, is the only way that he's going to make of us uh, what he can make. Then thirdly, we see the promise of a life that repents. Also there in verse 4, the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel as seemed good to the potter to make it. Uh, we see God is a God of second chances. There. Notice, if you will, 18, 6 through 8. O oh, house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. At one instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it. If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. So God is a God of second chances. If he were a God of second chances tonight, none of us would be here. Because we've all messed up at some point in our lives, and I've got news for you, I can't speak for nobody but myself, I still mess up. I still foul up. And God gives me another chance. The only time that we can't get another chance from God is if we leave this world without Jesus. We can't get another chance to repent and to turn to Christ if we leave this world without it. Called blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 7, 14, If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. This is what this nation, America, must do if we're going to be given the second chance with God. And um, I'm not saying it's impossible. I worry a little that we may have went over uh, uh, one of God's marks. And I just don't know. I hope that we as a nation can turn around, but I'm afraid we're headed on a course. Uh, and, and ultimately, Jesus uh, is coming. But uh, we must respond while we are still pliable so that he can make a new vessel out of us. We see third, the peril of a life that rebels. Notice, if you will, chapter 19, 10, and 11. Chapter 19, 10, and 11. Thou shalt break the bottle in the side of the men that go with thee, and shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Even so will I break this people and this city as one break of the potter's vessel that cannot be made whole again, and they shall bury them in top it till there be no place uh, to bear. The peril of a life that rebels. You know, if we don't, if you don't use clay, it's going to harden. I remember as a boy playing with play -Doh. And uh, if, you, if you don't use it, and if you put it back in the can without putting the lid on it, it's going to get hard. And you can't use it anymore. Same way with clay. If it hardens, you can't use it anymore. And uh, if, we, if we don't yield to God, the clay will harden. Uh, there, uh, 19, uh, verse 1, Thus saith the Lord, Go and get a potter's earthen bottle, and take of the ancients of the people, and of the ancients of uh, the priests. Uh, then notice, if you will, 10 through 12, uh, that then shall thou break the bottom of the side of the men that go with thee, and shall say unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, 
Even so will I break this people of this city as one part of the potter's vessel that cannot be made whole again, and they shall bury them and, and top it, so there shall be no more place to bury it. And notice 15, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring upon this city and upon all her towns on the, all the evil that I have pronounced against it, because they have hardened their necks, that they might not hear my words. Once the clay is hardened, God cannot remove it. If our hearts are too hardened tonight, if we're too hardened to God's gentle promptings of the Spirit, then God can't use us. Proverbs 29, 1, He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without there is a point that the child of God, I believe, and I believe that he or she can be saved, are saved. But they harden their hearts so much against the voice of the promptings of God, they're completely hard. He can't use them and he puts them on the shelf. I do believe uh, that that uh, will happen. Romans 11, 8, According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. Then in Romans, uh, we see there, because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain, vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was dark. Romans 1, 24, Wherefore God also gave them the uncleanliness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. He's talking here about the perversion going in uh, to homosexuality. Romans 1 26, for this God gave them the vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Homosexual, uh, homosexuality, not natural. We were not created that way. It is when we harden, when sinful man hardens himself, there that God will give them over to a reprobate mind. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. I don't believe it's too late for God to remake our lives. Maybe He wants to in some way to uh, remake our lives tonight. I don't know. That is only a question you and God can answer. Acts 16, 31, And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And my house. I believe that once, if a sinner leaves this world without uh, Jesus, there is no possibility of them coming to the Lord after this life. No purgatory, no second chance. 